Frank. You've got fans. Thank you. How are you, Frank? I'm great. Thank you very much. You doing well? I'm doing well. Any day I can wake up, I'm doing well. <laughs> I think uh, before we get started, one of the things that I thought was really interesting about Frank that I wanted everyone to know, and maybe you can settle a bet. If you read or you talk to anybody who knows Frank, um, you actually, for, for all you have achieved in the creative space, you didn't even want to originally do this. You didn't want to be an ad man. Um, I, if, I, I've read in your book, and some of it's in there, and some of it I hear whispers and rumors from around town that you actually wanted to be, is this true? You wanted to be a professional wrestler, uh, also, uh, a policeman and a comedian. You, those, you thought those one of those three things was where you were going before you even went into the creative space. Is any of that true? Totally true. Really? Yeah. I mean, honestly, I'd still like to be a cop. <laughs> I'd be like Columbo, you know. I'd be the old guy waiting around for the last clue. But the fact of the matter was that uh, I, I was not bad in school as an artist, you know, I, I could draw Bugs Bunny and, and all that, and I was pretty good at it. And um, I, when I got to be uh, about 19 years of age, I was a pretty big kid, you know, today I'm not a big kid compared to some of the kids today. I was six foot one, 220 pounds, and 19 years of age, and I thought, That's pretty well, big, Frank. That's well, big. yeah, but... It's a hefty size. Yeah, well, it, it was... So I d thought that maybe I wanted to be a professional wrestler, and, and because there's a, there's a reason for it is that it's an entertaining field, you know. And, and then I want to be a comedian, and, and, uh, and I thought that I would like to be a police officer. So, so I actually registered to go to the Vancouver School of Art, which is now Emily Carr. And uh, at the same time, I wrote this test for the Vancouver Police Department. There was 400 uh, applicants, and I passed the test, and there was only 10 of us. Why are we laughing? Yeah, I, <laughs> That's amazing, Frank. We should be applauding Well, I, I passed the test, and I was really good at, at uh, remembering faces. In fact, if I get off an airplane that I've been on, and I'm walking around the street in Vancouver, I go, that person was on my plane. I don't know the name, but I know the face. They must love it when you do that. No, I don't go up to them. <laughs> yeah. I would really be in trouble. I'd get a policeman after me. I know you. <laughs> But, but I really uh, was good at that, and I, so I passed the physical, I passed the written test, but I didn't pass the psychological test. And for 25 years, it bothered me why they didn't hire me until somebody I knew who was a really good HR person who said, Frank, you know why they didn't hire you? And I said, no, they knew you wouldn't take orders. Kind of and a, that's true, I don't. It's kind of, don't like taking orders. It's kind of a thing you need to do if you're a cop. You'd have to take yeah. certain orders, like don't shoot that person, you know. Yeah, yeah. yes. <laughs> yeah. I feel that that's a good test. And that's it would be a good, good. test, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's really good. I, when I read, uh, I read your book, and as I'm, I'm going through it, you know, you think about the high stakes of marketing and advertising, and you look at the, the pressure that a lot of agencies and creatives are under when you really are taking ownership of another brand or another company's, you know, sales and creative branding, um, I, I thought you would have a lot more in there about the creative process. And this word keeps coming up, and it's trust. You, like, it, it really comes up a lot in there. Um, why is trust fundamental to what you think is is your success and everything you've done? What does well, that mean? To I, you? I think trust is a, a, a key part of success. Um, I think if you trust somebody with your life you know, with a police officer again, or if you are uh, trusting somebody with millions of dollars in advertising, you're, tr you're trusting somebody with their brand and their reputation. Trust for me is, it, it's, it's the really one thing. And the story that comes back to me at that time was when we were selling a, a very large campaign to uh, Mohawk Oil in Vancouver, which used to be Mother Nature's gas station, and they used to have ethanol in their gasoline that made it more powerful and would go further. And we had, the president of the company was there, the marketing director of the company was there, our people were there, and I was watching the crowd. I was watching the room and watching the faces of everybody and how we made the sale. And I noticed that the president at the time, uh, Bill Duncan, I could see the face who was a little bit nervous. And, uh, but we made the sale. It went over well. And uh, everybody in our room was given the high fives. And, but I waited until about an hour because Bill's office was in... Uh, Burnaby, and I phoned him up and I said, hey, Bill, it's Frank. He said, Frank, it's good seeing you, great, you know. I said, but uh, I want to ask you a question. I said, you look nervous in the room. He said, yeah, you know, they, it was a little edgy. 
uh, a little nervous about it, but I said, but you're nervous about it, right? He said, yeah. I said, Bill, I'm not going to let you do the commercials. He said, well, what do you mean? I said, I don't want you to do anything that you're uncomfortable with. He said, what am I going to do? You're going to go tell your marketing director to go back to the advertising agency and the ask the agency to do another series of campaign. He said, can I do that? Bill, you're the president of Mohawk. Yeah, you can do that. So I'm sitting in my office and waiting for something to take place when the ad person who actually sold the ad came into my office and said, Frank, you're, you're, it's unbelievable. You're not going to believe what happened. I said, what? They said, we have to come up with a new campaign. <laughs> Bill is nervous. I said, really? <laughs> but you know what I could sell Bill from that day on? Yellow flamingos. Because, I mean, it, I have his trust or her trust that I was going to do the best thing for that client. Period. But that's, I mean, that's, that's a great story. I wonder where you find time in, the, in that trust exercise for a, lot of, for a lot of people trying to make those breakthroughs with brands and trying to even get those moments. You, you, you don't always, you had that right there. When did you have to fight for that trust? You, were, you had that connection easily and early enough, that opportunity. But we all know in this game, you've, you're, you're up against mega competitors. Like, have you ever had to really fight harder for that trust? Well, I, I think that sometimes trust doesn't come back to me. And, and at one time, uh, we were handling Safeway for Canada, and the head office was in Winnipeg, Manitoba. And I had found out by doing a little sleuthing. Detective Palmer. Detective Palmer, Palmer yes, yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Probably around. more like Canon, uh, uh, that I, I actually found out they were moving. And I knew at the time that Save on Foods and British Columbia, Jimmy Patterson's company, was looking for an ad agency, and they'd already gone out to the marketplace to a bunch of agencies. So I made a phone call to, the P to Brian Pewitt, who was the president. I said, Brian, it's Frank Palmer. He said, I know you, I know your name. I said, I'd like to pitch your business. And he said, well, you can't, because you have Safeway. And I said, well, I have a story I could tell you, if you give me time, because I'd like to pitch your business, and I can, obviously, I have lots of experience. We did super value, we did Safeway, we had a lot of experience. And he said, well, I'll think about it. There's five agencies, and I have to think about it. Well, he never called me back. So I had to call him back again. And I said, would you meet with me if I got a room in the Hotel Vancouver, which is where we met? Big private room, almost as big as this one. There was only us two guys in coffee in a room that was 5,000 square feet. <laughs> it's the only room they had. Wow. And, uh, That's amazing. So I, I, I met him in the room, and I told him a story. And, and he said to me, OK, you can pitch us. But the rules are you can't tell anybody. You can, you can have your team work on it, but they can't say anything. They can't have any rumors out there about it. Otherwise, I'll cut you off out of the pitch. And he said, you'll be the last one in, and I'll surprise even my people with the team that you came in. And uh, we were number six, and we came in, and we blew them out of the water. And, and we ended up owning that business for about five years while Brian was still president, and we did a lot of great ads for them. But my connection was right away, was trust with Brian that we would do a great job for him. So again, it all comes down to relationships and trust. Sure. And it's hard to build. It's really hard to build. When you, you know, just changing courses here for a second, I want to ask you about uh, change for a minute. And, you know, I don't, I don't want to suggest that you're old or anything. Um, <laughs> no, I don't. Let me set it up. <laughs> but, you know, your first job was, was at KVOS. Uh, you started your career there. And as I'm reading through the book, the first tool you're using is the printing press. Well, that's uh, really good. And that's a, that's a real, I mean, again, I'm not saying you're old, Frank. I'm just saying that. Only twice now. Yeah. For, <laughs> to, to have seen in, your, in 40 years of a career, to have been you know, witness to, at one point, using a printing press to the technology now, the change over 40 years in the creative space is extraordinary. And you've you've really literally had to have front row seats because you've had to take that technology and apply it to the campaigns you've created for your clients and understand it. Have, has, what's your thoughts on change and has any of it really just stand out to you? You know, social media, you know, internet, uh, the, the telephone, all that stuff, right? Have you, 
I, did, I didn't know Alex Gan Andrew, Alexander Graham Bell. I never uh, met him, but I know he invented the telephone. But what's your thoughts? Uh, how has well, change impacted it, it, your Everything your has changed. Our business has changed uh, dramatically. It's, uh, it, it changed uh, for anybody here that's ever watched uh, Mad Men. Uh, it was in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. And I was actually in the business in the middle 70s and 80s. And quite frankly, the show was really right on. I mean, it was, it was the business that I was in at the time. And it was a lot more fun back then, really a lot more fun. And, and we had real good relationships with the clients. I mean, in the afternoon, a client may come down to the office and say, I'm downtown for an hour. Can I drop in and have a drink? You know, and we, all of us had bar fridges. In our, you know, not today. We, don't, we can't even do yeah. that because procurement is involved. And we, you can't even buy them a cup of coffee because you think we're trying to sway them over to do work for us. But the business has changed, and we've had to find new ways to keep up with it. You've heard that young lady this morning talking about the influencers and social yeah. media and and that, that makes a big difference when you have stars like Drake who have 41 million followers the fact is that they can change the habits of buying and people and and so yeah it's changed a lot and our agency has had to do its best to, to stay up with uh, the changes and we have all the disciplines now that clients need and want and hopefully uh, but the, what's changed is is the relationship has changed because you don't get in front of the president or the CEO of the company, he or she, you don't get that audience anymore. You end up working through procurement and they want to do it for so many dollars per hour. What's your average dollar rate? It's kind of like if a surgeon knew how to save your life and he said it's a $100,000 operation and you could say, well, can you do it for 5,000? <laughs> no, go away, <laughs> die. I can. S <laughs> my, my, my point is, is, is that what happens today is they want fast, cheap, and good. You can have two, fast and cheap. You're not getting good. And that's what's happened to our business today. You look at TV, radio, newspapers, not much good advertising out there like they're used to do and the kind of ads that we used to do at one time when you had a budget and the client was believing in you and you could do these great Budweiser commercials or great car commercials, it's mm -hmm. just not the same. Do you, do you see though when you look at, uh, you know, one of the biggest, the biggest things to impact the industry and it, it's certainly where, in my space where I'm working right now uh, is data. We can do more, we, we have more data than we, we ever had before for, for a lot of industries, certainly for the creative, for marketing and advertising, we know everything. When you think back to that time when before we really had all this data about our, our, our customers and our consumers, um, you, had to, you had to think of those jingles and you had to think of those, those taglines and those really funny or really uh, provocative or, or heartful commercials with no data. You had to have intuition, you had to have gut instinct, you had to have the stuff. And now you have all this data and I wonder, do you, did that, did that make it easier for you or did, that, did it make it harder? And would you go back in time if you could to, to when you could use your instincts more? I, I would definitely go back in time, and not because I'm an old guy and I said it. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, is that when you, you're trained to do a certain job and you're trained up listening to people and you're knowing what people like or don't like, your instincts will tell you what's right or wrong. And, and it's really, you have to have the emotional connection. So you're not gonna sell somebody something they don't like just because you're gonna make them cry on TV. I mean, the curve marshals that I can't watch are the ones where the poor puppy is getting, you know, you know oh, God, I gotta be, I gotta, I'd have a hundred dogs by now because I, I get emotionally tied to it. But the fact is you've gotta have an emotional tie to something. Even comedy has to have a reason to have comedy to make you laugh that you're having a good time to drink a beer and have a pizza or whatever it happens to be. But yeah, I'd go back to making more decisions based on intuition because I feel like too often, too many times, People are looking at data to make excuses sure. because they don't want to make, hey, we're going to go in that direction, and then they, it didn't work, and they can say, well, the data told me it's going to work. Right. I think it's an excuse. I want to switch gears again to something. Yeah. Yeah. Right on. Um, comedy, sense of humor. Um, you're famous for this, literally. Um, 
my son Fox was in Frank's office the other day and, and we were hanging out and we were talking about some stuff and I couldn't even keep Frank on track because <laughs> he, his office is essentially a funhouse of, of practical joke toys and tools. He has fart machines and whoopee cushions and no, no he really, really does. Um, this, this guy is famous for all sorts of things. If, if, believe it or not, he's got this gag that he does and I'm giving it away because it, it has to stop Frank. He, he, he carries a little remote control with him, a universal remote control, and what he likes to do is go to the bars and in the middle of the hockey game, turn them off. And, and, and <laughs> makes people go nuts. And so he, he gives one to my son. And my son says, can we go to the bar, Dad? And I, I'm like, no. Um, you really take sense of humor really seriously, and it's a part of the culture at DDB, and you've even, the domain, Name funshui.com. You you actually own that domain name, don't yeah, you? Well, I just changed it ever slightly. Funshui instead of Fenshui, you know. And and but if I can tell you a quick uh, <laughs> part of that uh, little uh, uh, remote controller, which I buy by the dozens, by the way, because everybody wants it. You'll know if it happens in your <laughs> bar. I was sitting Frank in. Uh, they, there's two TV sets in the Wedgwood Hotel. One's <laughs> over the bar, and the other one's over here. So having breakfast, I go like this, and I turn it off, and the guy behind the bar sees it, so he goes over and turns it on. And I turn that one off. <laughs> and he goes over there, and he turns that one on, and I turn that one off. So after about six times of doing this, he calls the IS guy up from the basement, who says, he gets it up there, and he says, well, everything's fine now. And Susie walks away, I turn it off again. <laughs> and this is how the chairman and president of DDB spends his days. Um, well, Truly I did, an anthropologist I studying human beings in the wild. Yeah. No, but I, I, I think that... What does fun mean to you in the workplace? I, well, fun is having fun. In, listen, we live in a very pressured business, and, and what we do, we have to take very seriously in order to solve problems. You know, like sell more cars or sell more beer or sell more clothes. And with the way that business is going today for not a lot of people, the businesses are not, they're suffering. You know, retail suffering, car business is suffering. Every business is going through a change, and so is the advertising business. And, and so if you're under stress to come up with a concept or an idea where you're going to keep the client, because, I mean, at one point in time, we would have a review with a client maybe once every 10 or 15 years. Today, it's a year and a half. And there's no loyalty. You can't get to the president. You can't, as I said earlier. You just, you, so keeping fun in the workplace helps keep the culture healthy. Can any brand or organization be funny? Some of the, some of the best ads we know are, are just hilarious, and some of the, you, you think, I'll remember that. Can any brand do it? Uh, well, not every brand. No, I think that if you're with a, a serious uh, cause, uh, uh, disease, I don't think you can be comic about that. But I do believe that there's many brands, and whether they're retailers or automobile companies, you can have a little bit of fun. Uh, we did a campaign for Subaru where you see the cars all running around inside, a, a, you know, yeah. racing around like we're kind of herding cattle. And the point was that we were having fun with it, and it was a fun bunch of commercials. The client was too happy when we crashed up one of the cars, but, uh, <laughs> but it sold a lot of cars. It right. did, because it was showing the movability of the car in a, in a different kind of atmosphere rather than going down the street and driving 200 miles an hour, you know, kind of thing. But, yeah, you can. I, I, I don't think you can be, you know, and, and nor should you be funny with everything. I mean, there is a serious side of me. <laughs> no. 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 I highly doubt that. <laughs> no, but I, but I, I have to, you, I want to have fun. You want to lighten up your day. I think, though, you talk a lot in the book about uh, emotion as well and, and how it's critical to whatever approach and the creative you're going to take and that really resonates with me and anyone who's trying to do something creative in their day to day where does, you know, is there any data that tells you when it's time to do emotion or does that go back to what you're saying no, I, I think in the olden it, times when it was about the instinct and the intuition it comes back to the brief and what the client is trying to achieve and if if, if we have great creative people, which we do, and they're allowed to do what they are best at, not trying to do something cheap and fast, it, if they're allowed to give us a budget to do something properly, we normally will come up with an idea. We don't always sell them, because some of it may be a little bit risky for them, 
but I've gone into, uh, we did a whole bunch of commercials maybe 34 years ago, 40 years ago for Carter GM. And when uh, uh, we had a movie actor called Jackson Davies that was on the Beachcombers, and he played Constable Constable. And uh, most of the audience here is probably too young to know that, but we did everything wrong. Uh, we, he would be branding a, a car, but the brand was upside down. So everything he did, he slipped, he washed cars, he slipped. Uh, client said to me, is this going to work? I said, yeah, but you're going to buy it. Why? Because you're having some fun with a product and you're having fun with yourself. You're not taking yourself seriously because car business is not always a lot of fun because you get in there and they put you in another room and make you buy some stuff you don't need. So let's have some fun and make you look great. And we did. And he said, how long is it going to take to work? And I said, seven months. Oh, I got to wait seven months? He said, I said, yeah. But almost to the day, Carter's, after that point, was the biggest and best-selling GM dealership in Western Canada. He believed in us. He trusted me. Is marketing today broken? And, how, and if it is, I know I'm putting you on the spot with that one, how do you fix it? <laughs> it might be my last day if I said it was, but... Uh, <laughs> no, it, it, it's broken if they... If, if it's broken if we don't conform to what needs to be done. I mean, we got clients that want to buy data, we got data. We got clients that want to buy analytics, which is more information again. But again, it's getting all of that information that somebody wants to sort of sometimes use not to believe in some ads that really they, that we have a gut feeling that's going to work better than all the facts that you might get. And, and what we have to do is like that Wayne Gretzky quote, we got to chase the business as to where the puck's going to be, right? We got to go where the puck's going to be. And I think if we know where the puck's going to be, that's how we'll build our business in the future as to where the clients are going to be for us and we better be ready for them. Do you think, you know, Rachel David's TED Talk where she was really illuminating everyone to the new world of influencers yeah. and what that means for marketing, do you see that as the, the, the next step in what will continue to be evolutionary in the industry in terms of where it's going, or is that kind of the final step? Like, where else can it go beyond such direct influence? Well, I, I liked her point and I, uh, uh, about the fact is that Jennifer, Jennifer Aniston is, is making money selling uh, products, right? But at the same time, people who are also following influencers are, have to know that they're making money promoting the product too. So, well, young people may look at this Jenner lady as uh, attractive. <laughs> they look at her and, and say, well, she looks great. She's wearing certain products and, cer and, and wearing certain clothes and uses a certain kind of cologne. But every time somebody clicks on that, she's making a buck or two or a penny. And so she's not do they're not doing anything different than what's been done already before, except a professional actor is getting paid to say the same thing. I want you to think back to uh, 40 years ago. I want you to think back to when you were that, I'm going to say, young man. 12, 12. 12. Sure, sure. I want you to think back to, to that young man 40 years ago. Um, and if you were to go back in time to that, to that guy 40 years ago, and you were to give him a piece of paper, and on that piece of paper was going to list all these things you're going to do and that you've achieved and how you've literally helped define and build an industry. Um, I was going to say, would, would that blow your hair back? But I'm not going to say that. Um, <laughs> would, would, I'm just taller than my hair. Yeah. I, would, would, would you have believed that? And what, what would you say to that kid? Because, like, Frank, you've, you've really, you know, all kidding aside, you've really done some uh, amazing things in an industry or, really has pivoted around a lot of stuff you and your, your colleagues have done. W would you be surprised? Did you ever think that was going to happen? Um, I never thought that I would get to where I am today. No, I, I thought I'd be that cop. Uh, but uh, no, I, I wouldn't. But uh, you got to know that you never get to be successful without people helping you along the way. And if I had a, any kind of a, I suppose, uh, something that I was good at was finding someone that was better than me at a certain thing or service that they could provide to me. So surrounding myself with talented people helped me do better in my career. So I have a lot of people to thank. Right on. Yeah, yeah.
My, my, my last question for you, for anyone who is thinking or about to begin their creative career, creative of any kind, really, um, you know, who an artist, anyone who wants to do something and have even half of the career success you did, what is your advice to them? In, in the new world of where creatives have to live and work and create, you know, what would you say to them? How would you encourage them or, dis or discourage them? What would you say? Well, I, I, I was fortunate enough to um, be invited to the Vancouver Film School and watch 17 very talented young people pitch me a, a three-minute pitch, as you know. And I actually was truly blown away by the talent that they had. And I think that every one of those young people will have a great career uh, to follow through on. So I would, uh, I would encourage young people, even though the market's changing for them, and there's a, there's a, there is a terrific marketplace for them uh, if they have a little bit of belief in themselves and they, and they follow their dream. Well said. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the one and only Mr. Frank Palmer.